Bonjour. Good morning, and thank you for joining me. I'm Jerry DeMarco, Canada's Commissioner of the Environment and Sustainable Development. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. Je suis ici aujourd'hui pour présenter cinq rapports que nous avons remis au Parlement ce matin. Trois de ces rapports abordent la réduction des émissions de gaz à effet de serre qui s'impose d'urgence pour gérer la crise climatique mondiale. Les émissions au Canada sont plus élevées aujourd'hui que lorsque le pays et le monde se sont engagés pour la première fois à lutter contre le changement climatique il y a de cela More plus de 30 ans. Than 30 years ago. Targets and plans have come and gone, and Canada has yet to deliver on any. Meanwhile, the need to reverse the trend on Canada's greenhouse gas emissions has grown only more pressing. This is not my first time sounding the alarm, and I will continue to do so until Canada turns the tide. Our first audit focuses on the 2030 Emissions Reduction Plan developed by Environment and Climate Change Canada under the new Canadian Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act. While we were not required to begin reporting on the implementation of this plan until the end of 2024, given the urgent need for Canada to up its game in the fight against climate change, we decided to move more quickly. We found that the plan was insufficient to meet Canada's target to reduce emissions by 40 to 45 percent below the 2005 level by 2030. Selon ses projections les plus récentes, Environnement et Changement Climatique Canada a indiqué que les mesures détaillées dans le plan entraîneraient une réduction des émissions de seulement 34 par rapport au niveau de 2005. Les mesures qui s'imposent pour atteindre l'objectif de 2030 n'ont pas obtenu la priorité des ministères ou ont été retardées. Nous avons constaté un manque de fiabilité et de transparence en ce qui concerne la modélisation économique et celle des émissions, ce qui a porté le gouvernement à avancer des hypothèses trop optimistes sur la réduction attendue about emission reductions. Je suis aussi préoccupé par le fait que la responsabilité de réduire les émissions était répartie entre des organisations fédérales multiples qui ne relèvent pas directement au ministre de l'Environnement et du Changement climatique. Le ministre n'a donc pas le pouvoir d'obliger les autres entités à atteindre l'objectif. On the positive side, measures in the plan, such as carbon pricing and regulations, have the potential for deep emission reductions if they are stringent enough and applied widely. The federal government can still reduce emissions and meet its 2030 target with drive, focus, and leadership. Implementing our recommendations would be a step in the right direction. Let's turn now to our report on departmental progress in implementing sustainable development strategies. We assess the progress made by National Defense, Parks Canada, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and the Canada Border Services Agency in meeting the target of converting 80% of the federal fleet to zero emission vehicles by 2030. Together, these four organizations are responsible for most of the vehicles owned by the federal government. We found that the percentage of zero emission vehicles across all four organizations was very low, ranging between 1 and 3 percent in 2022. À ce rythme, seulement 13 percent des véhicules fédéraux seront sans émission d'ici 2030, ce qui est de 80 percent. Aucune des organisations n'avait d'approche stratégique pour indiquer comment elles comptaient atteindre la cible. 
avec 2030 comme objectif et étant donné que le gouvernement renouvelle habituellement ses véhicules au cercle, ces organisations doivent agir rapidement pour élaborer et mettre en œuvre des plans réalistes et qui leur permettront d'accueillir des véhicules à émission zéro afin que la flotte du gouvernement puisse contribuer à réduire les émissions de gaz à effet de serre. Also on the topic of zero emission vehicles, our audit of the zero emission vehicle infrastructure program found that Natural Resources Canada had contributed to expanding the charging infrastructure overall. The program is set to exceed its 2026 target of installing 33,500 charging ports. As of July 2023, 33,887 charging ports were either completed or under development. However, we also found that in funding charging stations, the department had not prioritized underserved areas, including rural, remote, and indigenous communities, and lower income areas. The vast majority of the ports were located in Ontario, Quebec, and British Columbia. Même si le gouvernement fédéral n'est pas le seul responsable du financement des bornes de recharge pour les véhicules à émission zéro, on peut en faire plus pour aider à corriger les écarts d'infrastructures qui sont peu susceptibles d'être comblés par le secteur privé. Nous avons constaté que Ressources naturelles Canada n'avait pas recueilli des données pour l'aider à cerner ces lacunes et il n'avait pas établi d'objectifs pour les régions mal desservies. There remains a large gap between the current number of charging stations and those needed by 2035. Natural Resources Canada needs to work with other levels of government and with the private sector to address gaps in charging infrastructure So Canadians feel confident making the switch to zero emission vehicles. Passons maintenant à notre audit de la surveillance des prises de pêche maritime commerciale. Nous avons constaté que les pêches et les océans au Canada n'avaient pas réussi à recueillir des données fiables et opportunes sur les prises de poissons. Le ministère n'avait pas une vue d'ensemble de la santé des stocks de poissons au Canada. Nous avons aussi signalé que le ministère devait améliorer sa surveillance des renseignements fournis par les tiers parties. Nous avons constaté qu'un grand nombre de faiblesses que nous avions signalées il y a sept ans lors de notre dernière audit sur tous ces secteurs posent toujours problème. Par exemple, le ministère a créé une politique de surveillance des pêches en réponse à une recommandation formulée dans notre rapport de 2017, mais nous avons constaté qu'il ne l'avait pas mise en œuvre et que cette politique n'était pas soutenue par des ressources ou un plan d'action. Seven years ago, we also flagged that Fisheries and Oceans Canada's information management systems needed to be modernized to support the collection of dependable and timely data. We found that progress in this area has been very slow. Fisheries and Oceans Canada has spent about $31 million to implement a system to provide ready access to data and integrate information across all of its regions. However, we found that the department's rollout of this new system is incomplete and that a full launch has been delayed by 10 years. Without dependable and timely data on fish being caught, Fisheries and Oceans Canada does not know whether commercial stocks are being overfished. The collapse of the Atlantic cod population in the 1990s, with its far-reaching economic and social impacts, has shown that it is far more expensive and difficult to recover depleted stocks than it is to keep them healthy in the first place. Ce matin, nous avons également This publié morning, le rapport annuel sur les pétitions en matière d'environnement. Les pétitions permettent à la population canadienne de soulever leurs préoccupations en matière d'environnement et de développement durable et d'obtenir des réponses des ministres responsables. En conclusion, In closing, je souhaite réitérer qu'il sera bien trop tard pour éviter les effets catastrophiques du changement climatique. Le feu de forêt intense. 
intense la forest fumée fires, dans le ciel, smoke filled skies, la vague de chaleur, heat waves, les orages violents, violent storms, et les inondations and flooding sont de plus en plus graves are et becoming fréquents. more severe and frequent. Et ce sont les Canadiens et Canadiens partout au pays qui en subissent les conséquences. Canada. Canada is the only G7 country that has not achieved any emission reduction since 1990. Taking meaningful action to reduce emissions is the most impactful thing Canada can do to play its part in addressing the global climate emergency. Solutions exist, such as renewing the government's fleet with zero emission vehicles, or implementing effective fiscal and regulatory measures to reduce greenhouse gases. The problem is that available solutions are being implemented much too slowly. That needs to change now. Thank you. I am now ready to answer your questions. Merci. I'm assuming everyone wants a question, so we'll just go with that. We'll start with Marika Walsh from the Global Mail because she's closest to me. Uh, hi, sir. Um, could you uh, just clarify for Canadians, we hear over and over in the talking points from the federal government that Canada is on track to meet its emissions targets and that under the Liberal plan, it will for the first time meet its emissions targets. Why are you so certain that it will not? So what we're saying is the measures in the current plan are not sufficient to meet the target. Whether they will meet the target is a different question. If they implement our recommendations, impose additional measures not in the plan, then they can still have time to meet the target. But the plan as it stands now adds up in their own estimation to only 34%. The target is 40 to 45%. Thank you. And the government's plan in March 2022 um, charted, uh, was able to calculate a 36.4% reduction. And then it said very clearly that there were sort of unmodelable changes, uh, for example, around public transportation use that would have closed the gap to 40%. Are you saying that there is no such thing as something that's unmodelable that will close that gap between the number that is in the plans and what Canada has said it will achieve? So they can close the gap. We and their own uh, projections submitted to the United Nations see reductions of, uh, attributable to concrete measures that add up to 34%, previously 36, but now down to 34. Bridging that gap with other initiatives is what is needed to meet the target. And they can't just have a hope to fill those in with assumptions and so on. They'll need measures that will actually fill that gap. And we're releasing this report early to help them course correct in order to meet the target, as opposed to coming in late and just explaining why they didn't meet another target. Sorry, uh, Estelle, Brad Radio Canada. Question. I'd like to ask something about Report 7. Why is it unlikely for the government to meet its 2030 electric vehicle targets? Why is it unlikely? Because the target is 80%. The target is 80%, and currently the total is about 3%, uh, between 1 and 3% for the four. Uh, Organizations Parce que les véhicules ont une vie de Given durée de sept ans, ils ont besoin de, de agir maintenant the government will need pour atteindre une cible de 2030. Ils ne peuvent pas laisser jusqu'à le dernier moment pour well atteindre la cible. Ils peuvent minute. faire ça, mais ils ont besoin I mean, de, de retirer beaucoup de, de véhicules qui, qui sont encore uh, utiles. Alors, on ne peut pas avoir ça dans une manière Alors, s'il agit maintenant, if the government acts le, now le, by le purchasing vehicle, vehicles, the cible, they will need to de change their target immediately. But they will need to course correct now. Deuxième question. Donc, quelles devraient être question. les priorités du gouvernement dans, pour atteindre What should the government's cible, priority be as it seeks to meet its targets if it wants to get caught up uh, quickly and efficiently? Um, alors, ils ont besoin d'avoir des plans stratégiques pour chaque ministère. Ils ont besoin de, de, 
comme j'avais dit je, il noted, y a quelques moments, uh, ils ont besoin ago, de, de commencer à acheter le, le véhicule à zéro émission dès que maintenant, parce qu'ils vont, ils vont avoir une vie de 7 ans, et, et aujourd'hui c'est 2023, et le, Today, now it is 2023, and the target is in 2030. Et, so, a strategic uh, plan the, and, the, the, and purchasing zero emissions vehicles starting Alex now. Alex Trauma Star. Thank you very much. Yeah, my understanding, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong, and, and maybe uh, just explain this, the 34%, this is Report 6, the 40, 34% um, modeling, I guess, of the expected reductions, my understanding is that you've, you've said that that's based on overly, overly optimistic assumptions and that there's, there's holes even in the reliability of that projection. Can you, can you walk us through uh, the doubts you have about that and why you have them? Right. So the 34% is Environment Canada's own projection. We have not been able to verify the accuracy of that. We're just indicating what they believe their concrete measures add up to. So that's a problem made off the bat that their own measures don't add up to 40%. But as I said before, they can they can add measures to try to bridge the gap. The problems that we have, even with the concrete measures that are in there, so this is this is these are our concerns about the 34%, are that there's assumptions about no delays in the rollout of the key measures, and we've already seen and in, in uh, history tells us in Canada that. Very rarely are measures put out early. They're usually quite late, such as uh, clean fuels as being the most re recent. So, the model is assuming no delays, which is which is uh, which is improbable based on past performance. I'll say that. Um, they also um, assume that there'll be technological advances that you know aren't in the bank right now. So there are lots of existing technologies to reduce emissions, but there is reliance in the plan for the 34% on, uh, for example, 27 megatons associated with carbon capture and storage. Unclear whether that is a reasonable assumption to make given current, uh, current uh, issues with carbon capture. And then also there was a lack of factoring in the actual cost of the climate that's already changing. So increase um, installation and use of air conditioners in areas that used to get by without them could increase the pressure on the grid, especially if everyone moves towards more electric sources. On the other hand, there could even be some places where they don't require home heating as much and there'd be a drop in demand. So we, we need to see all of that factored in to see how it nets out. So, but in a nutshell, overly optimistic assumptions about the timeliness of the rollout and then individual assumptions in here that are questionable. In any event, they recognize that they're not going to meet 40% with these measures, so they're gonna to have to do more, not just fix these problems with the assumptions, that would get them to the 34. They need to also bridge the gap to the 40. And eventually, I foresee that given, um, given the pressure and the, and the global recognition of the crisis that is occurring with climate, we could even see Canada having to up its own target from 40% to 50 or 60 in the next couple of years. So they have to aim higher, not just to correct for the fact that they've always missed in previous years, but they also have to aim higher because it could very well be that the target will have to be updated very soon. And just uh, as a follow-up, um, the report mentions um, uh, one of the recommendations that they should uh, prioritize sort of the the, mo the, the beefiest measures uh, to slash emissions and implement them first. I'm wondering if you have thoughts on what exactly uh, they should kind of hit the gas pedal on in terms of prioritizing uh, measures as they as they try and hit the target. Yeah, so there's lots of measures in the plan, and there are some good aspects of the plan. It's an improvement over previous ones, but one of the deficiencies we've identified is there isn't enough of a strategic focus and a timeliness focus on uh, the big ticket items. So carbon pricing and uh, a range of regulations are the two main areas where they're gonna get most of the reductions, especially with regulations, because there's so many individual ones and they each go through their own consultation and development process. They have to prioritize those and get those rolling out faster than previously. And I've heard the ministers express the same frustration about the slow pace of developing and implementing 
regulations. Regulations aren't a flip of a switch. Once once they're adopted, there's often a phase-in period. It takes several years. So if the if the adoption is slowed down, then the actual return on the investment for the, the uh, regulations is pushed into the future, putting in jeopardy the 2026 objective of 20 percent and the 2030 objective of 40 percent. Uh, Melanie Cret, Le Devoir. Uh, la presse. <laughs> Euh, je voulais savoir justement vous parler que le fait que la réglementation euh, prend beaucoup de temps. Là, you were talking about how regulations euh, je me demandais si on vous a donné des raisons effect. pourquoi, euh, par exemple, celles qui touchent l'industrie pétrolière et la régulation pour le oil et le gaz secteur n'ont pas encore été mises en place. C'était le sujet de l'un de nos rapports au printemps de cette année, le, uh, notre rapport sur le règlement, les émissions de gaz à effet de serre. Alors, ils ont des, des raisons. Gas, et des emissions. excuses the uh, has its pour, and uh, its excuses pour uh, le fait qu'ils sont retardés avec ce règlement. Mais on sait que c'est quelque chose qui est vraiment une priorité pour But le gouvernement. Le gouvernement peut for agir that is really uh, a for the avec, uh, de façon rapide. It Alors c'est vraiment une question quicker. de volonté so et, really et de prioritisation. Et bon, euh, la tarification sur le, tar le carbone fait l'objet de tout un débat. Là, carbon euh, pricing is raising considerable debates in the House these days. Vous pensez que le l'exemption qui est accordée pour le mazout est de nature à affaiblir euh, cette mesure. Là? Exemptions for Alors, heating ce, fuel could weaken ce, ce débat et le, euh, cette décision. Uh, est arrivé après la décision de notre audit. Alors, je, on ne sait pas les effets written, de so l'exemption. La question que je, je poserai pour la, la prochaine rapport, la, la question prochaine, est-ce qu'ils ont fait l'analyse uh, pour savoir si ça va diminuer leur chance à atteindre leur cible? Combien de pourcentage est-ce que l'effet va avoir? Est-ce que la décision et l'analyse étaient... Uh, fait dans une manière qui a analysé uh, l'égalité et le, 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 les objectifs de développement durable uh, en ce qui concerne la, and, uh, la concerns, population vulnérable et, et tout ça. Well Alors, the, il y a the, beaucoup de questions. As well as Est-ce qu'il va aussi avoir so un effet sur, um, sur le marché? Est-ce qu'il y a un secteur privé qui ne va pas avoir assez de confiance? Dans Perhaps the private sector, the sector now will carbon. not have, uh, Alors, have less confidence in the carbon pricing system. system. So et, uh, I will be seeking to determine whether the government carried prochaine. out this analysis. This will be something uh, to discuss next year. So the, um, The latest developments relating to heating oil happened after the close of our audit, obviously. So we did not audit that decision. Um, and we have no uh, documentation behind it in terms of analysis. What I'd like to have seen, in, and, and it may exist, it's something you can ask uh, the department for, did they look at whether the decision would have an effect on diminishing the chances of reaching the target and by what percentage? Did they look at the uh, effect of the measure and, and related measures on vulnerable populations in terms of uh, making sure that no one is left behind according to the sustainable development goals from an equity point of view? And thirdly, did they analyze and look at whether there was going to be any negative effect on the private sector in terms of um, uh, carbon price signaling and the effect that that has on Uh, investments in research and development and the adoption of new technologies. I might have added a bit more in English there, but uh, rough translation. <laughs> we'll go to Judy Trin from CTV News. Thank you. Um, in regards to carbon pricing, you said that this is a you know a key element of the uh, the environment policy. I was wondering, in terms of your assessment, what percentage? of the government's goal to even its reduced target of 34 percent relies on adherence to the carbon pricing policy. Uh, thank you. So they haven't reduced their target to 34 percent. They've just estimated that their current measures will get them to 34 percent. The target remains 40 to 45 percent. Um, you and I would both like to know what their estimate of the uh, of the 
portion of their target is going to be met by the carbon price. The, a big theme of this first report of ours under the Net Zero Act is that Environment Canada is not transparent enough with the uh, calculation of how each measure is going to achieve its proportionate share of the uh, of the overall target. So we've made several recommendations in here. Most agreed, although only a couple or a couple only partially agreed, and several of them get at the fact that not only our office but Canadians need to know the work behind these numbers to say, okay, am I getting value for money for the outlay of the uh, uh, of the um, carbon levy, for example? What what emissions are you reducing at the various price points that that uh, the carbon price is going to go through from sixty five this year to one hundred and seventy dollars? Um, seven years from now. So I would like to know that as well. And because Canada doesn't have as transparent an approach as it should with respect to the modeling of emission reductions, I can't verify one way or another whether each of their component pieces, including signature pieces like carbon pricing and regulation, if what what degree they are going to um, to play in uh, in adding up to the forty percent, for example. Question: Do you have a province by province breakdown at all in terms of how each province is doing in regards to some of these measures? And I'm thinking specifically about Quebec. Um, is it able to meet its level? Do you have a sense because it's opted out of carbon pricing, the carbon tax? So uh, nobody can opt out of carbon pricing. They can either use the federal one or have their own. So Quebec does have a carbon price, but it's their own uh, their own system um, rather than the federal one. If a province doesn't have one or doesn't have a good enough one, then the federal backstop kicks in. So there's carbon pricing everywhere, which is which is a a good thing in terms of equal coverage. Um, the we didn't do a deep dive into the. Um, into the regions with respect to carbon pricing in this report because we did a full report on carbon pricing just over a year ago and there we noted where there were gaps uh, in provinces um, uh, in, the, in terms of the provinces having systems that were not necessarily equivalent to the federal one. We'll be going back to that again in a few years but um, because we did it so recently we didn't do another deep dive into carbon pricing this year. Valerie Bain, Radio Canada. Question. Is it too late to, for Canada to meet its targets? Early on, you mentioned you, this was not the first time where you observed that the federal government is not set to meet its targets. It's getting repetitive. Could you uh, comment on this? Answer, yes. It is getting repetitive. But again, as I noted, I will continue sounding the alarm. Until the government meets its targets, is there enough time left for the government to meet its targets? Yes, it is still possible for the government to meet its 2030 targets. But they will need to do much better now than they, they have over the past 30 years. They need more measures than are found in the current plan. If they implement our recommendations measures, and add additional measures, there uh, remains pour, enough time pour, um, to meet ça va, ça va the target. Travail parce que it will be a, a considerable effort because Canada has dragged its feet for 30 years and now has only seven years left to do the majority of greenhouse gas emissions reduction. If it is to meet its 2030 target and then its uh, eventual 2050 target, question. Is the problem uh, found with the oil and gas sector? Just following up on my colleague's question, is it that oil and gas is not, our players are not meeting their own target? Would that explain the fact that Canada is not set to meet its targets? There are a number of reasons why Canada is not on track to meet its current targets. 
looking at the issue more broadly, I would point to a lack of leadership, a lack of coordination, and all that. It's all found in our 2021 report. As for the oil and gas sector, even though there has been improvements in the electricity sector, for example, from the 1990s to the present, Les émissions ont augmenté uh, très uh, uh, beaucoup avec, uh, avec le secteur pétrolier et gazier. The oil and gas sector à have peu près 80 à 90 depuis 1990 jusqu'à maintenant. So progress in other sectors of the economy has been partially cancelled out due to increased emissions from oil, gas, and also transportation. These sectors are considerably increasing their emissions. Ça, c'est plus que le progrès dans les autres secteurs. And that more than cancels out the progress in other sectors. Regardez à ces secteurs pour mieux atteindre les objectifs de 80 à 90 avec l'augmentation avec le pétrolier, le secteur pétrolier. Oil and gas emissions have gone up by 80 to 90 percent. Un grand parti de la problème. And that represents a major part of the problem. Davis Lagri, iPolitics. Thanks very much. Uh, I just wanted to clarify or, or confirm something, because you mentioned that the measures included in the emissions reduction plan are, are insufficient, but you also point out that uh, delays in implementing policies is a problem with this government as well. So do I, do I have this right? You're saying not only is the federal government falling short on implementation, but it also lacks the necessary policy ambition. Is that fair to say? So their existing policies don't add up to 40 percent, so there's a gap there. And their history to date is that for the measures they do announce and adopt, they often take longer to implement than they were intending. And we actually have a full table. There's a full page in here indicating um, several important measures and the degree to which they, um, they were delayed. That's Exhibit 6.6. .6. Yeah, my follow-up was actually about that table. It's a, okay. it's a great table, or, or maybe a sad table, I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, the, you give out the various reasons why each measure has been delayed. And when you ask Mr. Gibo about the emissions cap or anything, he'll always say that there's no holdups, we're still consulting, we're still engaging. But this table would suggest that there's almost, to me, a, a systemic problem with these climate measures being implemented. And I'm wondering if you see it the same way. Is there some sort of cultural problem here? Yeah, I think I addressed this issue in French briefly earlier. When a, when a government prioritizes something, the, things can happen quickly. So if they have the will to act like it's a crisis rather than just saying it's a crisis, then they can roll things out more quickly. There's no, there's no um, requirement, for example, that uh, regulations on clean fuels should take five years to develop. Um, we, we've seen the, the government um, speak about the climate emergency and speak about the climate crisis and the related biodiversity crisis, but we aren't seeing a commensurate um, um, rapid rollout of the measures to address those crises. Peter Masaru, Hill Times. We've seen now um, for many years governments in Canada talking about emissions reduction seen now for several years uh, the federal government starting to roll out emission reduction um, programs and policies the annual numbers that we're seeing suggest that there's no downward trend yet at all in emissions why so um, here's the trend from 1990 the original baseline year when the when the climate uh, convention was adopted in 1992 to 2005 the current baseline year for our for our nationally determined contribution under the paris agreement to now so you'll see that the trend from 1990 to now is up you see two very noticeable dips associated with the global climate, uh, financial crisis and the uh, the covid pandemic what we'd like to see is a consistent trend downward. It's interesting to note that 
Canada's interim target or interim objective for 2026, which is only three years from now, is only to get back to where we started in 1990. So that's how, how um, problematic Canada's record has been. Its next ambition is simply to get back to the starting line from when, from when Canada and the world agreed to address climate change back in 1992. So there, there are a number of reasons, as I mentioned in French, there, if you break this down by sector into seven or eight sectors, as, as Canada does in the uh, information made available by Environment Canada, you see an 88% increase in the oil and gas sector over this time. That drowns out progress made in the, the smaller sectors like electricity and so on. Because of that and other factors related to transportation, especially as well as buildings, any progress made in all the other sec sectors is having no net positive impact because of these other sectors that are that are um, increasing their emissions so at such a uh, to such a degree. So Canada does have to get a handle on the fact that it has allowed certain sectors to keep increasing their total emissions, even though their their per unit productivity is becoming more efficient. So they're more efficient at polluting now, but the total amount has been going up. And that's true in both oil and gas and transportation. But if, if they don't get a handle on the total amount, there's no way of meeting their target, which is a total amount. It's not just about getting more efficient at, at polluting. It's about actually reducing the amount of greenhouse gases being emitted. And remember that global temperature is correlated with the actual concentration of gases in the atmosphere, amongst other things. So the fact that we've become more efficient at polluting doesn't help in terms of the ultimate climate crisis in terms of global temperature rise. The total amount of emissions needs to come down. Do you see any way that the government could meet its target if the carbon pricing, the federal carbon backstop was eliminated? Is there any way to meet the target if you don't use carbon pricing? There are lots of different ways of reducing emissions, lots of different policies and uh, instruments, regulations, laws, and so on. Um, it's up to the government to decide what is in its portfolio of measures. They happen to have 80 in this plan plus another 37 coming, but there's no, um, there's no uh, research to show that you can only reduce by choosing a selected measure or another. It's, it's whether the measures are effective, whatever ones are chosen. We say you need to prioritize the measures and you need to become much more transparent about the efficacy of those measures and report on it in a timely manner so that they can course correct. None of those things have happened in, in Canada over the last 30 years. And for that reason, Canada is the only country in, in the G7 whose emissions are higher now than uh, than in 1990 compared to the other countries. But what this also shows is that it is doable. Some of these places have quite different approaches to reducing uh, emissions, but they've all managed some level of reduction since 1990. So that's that gives me some optimism. It's, it's difficult to have some optimism reporting on climate change in Canada, but this gives me a little bit of optimism to, when I see that other G7 countries have reduced emissions. So it's the fact that uh, our past performance has been such is not an automatic predictor that future performance will be yet another missed target. If the will is there the, and the measures are effective uh, and implemented in a timely manner, it's possible. It's just a question of will. David Thurton, CBC News. Hi, Commissioner. If, I, if I'm quoting you correctly or paraphrasing you correctly, you're saying Canada is the only country in the G7 that hasn't reduced our emissions since 1990. Is that correct? Yes. So the, the blue on this graph are emissions since 1990. This is the origin line, zero. Canada is the only one that has not reduced emissions since 1990. So, so what do you make of, I guess, Minister Gilbo, the environment minister, when he often says that Canada has the best emissions reduction in the G7 since 2015? Um, what do you make of a statement like that. Yeah, so this is the full, this is every year's data, right? And you can pick particular points, and especially if you include a, a, a section of COVID, which, which uh, Environment Canada has been doing lately, to show drops. There, are, there, there have been drops and so on, but uh, 
the fact remains is that we're much higher now than when we started in 1990. So, um, so we need to bring this curve down all the way to here to the 2030 target. Sure, there are periods of time where Canada's seen drops, but we're still there's no there's no doubt that we're higher now than we were in 1990, and we're unique in amongst the G7 in that respect. I guess so. I mean, what do you make of those comments? Do you think it masks the true reductions that are needed? Yeah, I mean, just looking at the last uh, few years, um, you would expect to see some some progress because of, there's more measures now than before. So this plan is better than previous plans in that it has key measures like carbon pricing and regulations, notwithstanding the problems of increased emissions in, in key sectors. So there are things that should be bearing fruit. What I said is that the, the items that are bearing fruit are being compensated more than on a one-to-one -one basis for the increase in overall emissions from, from oil and gas and transport um, and, um, and buildings uh, as well. So they've got to bring everything down in order to, to meet the target. They can't just have one you know, lone wolf sector that is drowning out all of the others. And that's, that's, that's been Canada's main difficulty if you look at it from a sector by sector basis is is oil and gas and transportation have become such a large portion of our emissions that unless Canada gets a handle on those, then all the progress in the world on all the others won't 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 add up to enough. I'm going to take a chair's prerogative and put my reporter's hat on for a minute. Uh, Mia Rabson from the Canadian Press. I don't think I actually introduced myself earlier. Um, one of the complaints about carbon pricing from the public is often that they don't see a connection between the carbon price and reduced emissions. And it seems in this report you are also pointing out that that's the same for many of the, the policies that the government is doing, that they've really only set or shown specific targets for some of them. How hard do you think it is with carbon pricing in particular to explain to people how many emissions it actually is cutting when we've seen no transparency on that? Yeah, it's, I find it odd that the government isn't more transparent about the results it is getting from the measures because it just makes it harder for the government um, to convince Canadians of the utility of those measures. So we'd be interested in the transparency from the perspective of can we replicate their model and see whether it adds up to 34% or 40%, for example. But I think Canadians would benefit from that accountability and transparency because they could see the value for money in these various initiatives. All of these initiatives cost somebody something. They either cost the government for the rollout of infrastructure, they cost in Canadians in terms of the carbon levy, or they cost industry. So why not show your work in terms of the federal government of what bang for the buck they're getting from each measure? And I know that there are interactions amongst measures, so you can't necessarily parse out every single one of these 80 measures to figure out the exact amount of reductions, but you can at least do a better job of, of counting it and, and communicating it to the public. So, you know, economists agree that carbon pricing is an efficient, is an efficient way of bringing down emissions. That's that's well understood, and, and we note that in our report on carbon pricing from a couple of years ago. But what's efficient from an economics point of view also has to be palatable for the general public. And the federal government can certainly do itself a favor by becoming more transparent and coming clean about how much bang for the buck it's getting from all of its key initiatives. It doesn't have to go through all 80 and have a report on all 80, but for the key ones like carbon pricing and each of these key regulations, I'd like to be able to audit them one by one and be able to see whether they're actually achieving those reductions, but they're not transparent enough even with us, let alone the Canadian public, about the work that goes into some of these numbers. And given your concerns with the lack of transparency and the shortfalls that the government is showing on meeting its targets. How hopeful are you that at some point they're going to, we're going to start to see that tipping point. There are all these policies on the table delayed or not. Do you believe that at some point there will be a tipping point with these policies? Do you have hope that that's going to happen? A tipping point in terms of the curve coming down? Uh, it's not something that one can know for sure, because I don't know, for example, whether Canada is willing to actually 
get a handle on oil and gas emissions and transport emissions. If they're serious about that, and it's not just you know a minor measure, but it's something that actually brings them down, then then sure you'll see the you'll see the graph go down like it has in other countries that that have reduced reliance on fossil fuels and and transitioned to renewables. There's, there's already lots of examples in Europe about that happening. So Canada can do it. I can't predict. There's a lot of political factors and others behind your question. I can't predict whether it'll happen, but it's certainly possible for them to do it. It's just a question of will, as I mentioned earlier. And we have one question online. Uh, Rochelle Baker from the National Observer. Please go ahead. Hi there, can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, Mr. DeMarco, I'm actually going to pull you away from the emissions reports to the DFO fisheries report. Um, your recommendations, uh, I, I noticed that DFO has agreed uh, to all your recommendations, but they have done so in 2016, I gather, as well. Um, the recommendations concentrate on speeding up monitoring uh, policy, uh, the implementation of the monitoring policy policy and the integrated info system and concerns around third party observers and the quality of the data that they're providing across the fisheries in a timely manner. Um, do you have a, uh, in terms of speeding up these things or creating this kind of improving the quality of third party data around these important fisheries, are there any that strike you as the most urgent and or important from the recommendations? And I guess what concretely needs to take place um, in order for that to happen? Is it concrete timelines, resources, everything? Where could the gains most be made? Thank you for the question. So the, um, the key with these recommendations is for the Department of Fisheries and Oceans to acquire dependable and timely data so that it has a better handle on whether fish stocks are being managed sustainably. It was disappointing to find that many of our recommendations from our office from seven years ago still apply today. In terms of prioritization, um, your question relating to that, uh, the implementation, resourcing and putting in a plan to implement the policy that they put in place in response to our audit from seven years ago would be a key thing because that policy, the fisheries monitoring policy, it's it's just a policy on paper. There's a table in our report showing that no fish stock has gone through all the steps in the policy yet, even though our audit was seven years ago. So that would be a key one, would be the the implementation of the very policy that they created the first time we highlighted the problems in this sector uh, seven years ago. Rochelle? We, we have, oh, oh, okay. So, so we have a sense of timelines associated with emissions and when deadlines for when these things need to occur. Do you have a similar sort of, um, a sense of when it's critical that, uh, DFO, uh, meet these objectives and mm. what the potential consequences might be otherwise. Yeah, so as disappointing as the report itself is, given that we've had to restate some conclusions from seven years ago and re-recommend um, measures, what gives me some hope is that if you look at the responses to this report and even contrast it, for example, to Environment Canada's responses in the uh, Net Zero Act report, you see concrete commitments from the department and timelines. And, and to your question specifically, they've committed to uh, specific timelines in each of the recommendations. So the, the, the responses are strong in this report. We won't just assume that that, that, that means that uh, good things will happen because we wouldn't be issuing a report that was so similar to the one seven years ago if, if just having a good response is enough. But, uh, but I, do, uh, I do express some optimism by the fact that 
The department has gone out of its way to provide concrete responses with timelines. And if those timelines are met, then by the time we audit this again, I expect we would have a better picture of whether, in fact, Canada is sustainably managing the fish stocks. We had hoped to be able to help answer that question in this audit, but the the lines of inquiry led us to the path of just trying to help them fill the gaps in their information base so that eventually they'll have a better handle on the on the health of fish stocks. So this is all about tidying up the their system for gathering information in order to to make sustainable decisions regarding fisheries in the future. Okay, I think that uh, will end our press conference for today. Thank you everyone. Have a great day.